the only major distinction in Wilder's creative process with her editor was that from the beginning, her primary literary editor was also her daughter. And because of Lane's unique personality and experience as a newspaper columnist, Lane's editorial style was more aggressive and even intrusive than someone like Marion Furies would have been. Literary editors, unlike news editors, rarely rewrite scenes. As veteran children's book editor Marjorie Kyler points out, the imagination is fragile as is the ego, so the editor must step carefully. Yet Wilder trusted and valued her daughter's editorial opinions, just as she had 10 years earlier when Lane pushed her mother into the big magazine markets. So Wilder set to work in the Rock House on revisions for Juvenile Pioneer Girl. As she explained later to Lane, when several books in the Little House series had already been launched, the only way I can write is to wander along with the story, then rewrite and rearrange and change it everywhere. When Wilder says here that she had to wander along with the story and rewrite and rearrange and change it everywhere, most working writers recognize this process. A rewritten manuscript prepared for an editor at a publishing house usually requires this kind of extensive revision. Rarely is the creative process all about divine dictation. It's about tearing into sentences, paragraphs, and chapters, then ruthlessly, objectively, rethinking everything and sometimes starting over. What emerges after revision in the best manuscripts is a kind of effortless writing and a structural inevitability which makes readers believe that what they're reading on the page could not possibly have been written any other way. Lane eventually returned to Rocky Ridge Farm in 1931 and waited for her mother's revised manuscript. It was ready in May. And according to Lane's diary, she spent five days making her own edits and revisions to the manuscript and two days typing it. Lane's diary also indicates that she and her mother met together to brainstorm ideas about the book. Ultimately, Wilder read the final typewritten copy and approved Lane's final edits. Other than Lane's very brief diary entries, almost nothing exists to illuminate our current understanding of how these two women actually worked together on the first novel or the next two books in the series. But later in the semester, we'll examine their editorial process more closely through a series of letters between the two written when Lane had moved from Rocky Ridge Farm to Columbia, Missouri. So stay tuned. The revision that Wilder submitted to Marion Fury exhibited the characteristics of an extraordinarily accomplished writer. But Fury had absolutely no idea that the manuscript had already been edited by Lane. Lane's role in the process was a secret shared only between mother and daughter. Perhaps because of the manuscript's unusually smooth, polished, and effortless style, Fairy did something extremely unusual. In September 1931, on behalf of Knopf Publishing, she offered Wilder a three-book contract with plans to publish the first book the following year, in 1932. Why was this unusual? It was 1931. The Great Depression was deepening. Literary markets were suffering. Many Americans struggled to put food on the table, much less buy books. And remember, Wilder was an unknown in 1931. Fury had seen nothing from Wilder other than the rough draft of Pioneer Girl and its revised manuscript. Fury was clearly impressed with this revision and impressed enough to take a big chance with Laura Ingalls Wilder and her first book. There was just one thing that hadn't impressed Fury about the revision, and that was the title. Both Wilder and Lane had struggled to find the right title for this book. A surviving typewritten list of titles includes these rejections, among several others. Long Ago in the Big Woods, Trundle Bed Tales, and Little Pioneer Girl. 
Ferry herself chose the title and made it part of the three book deal. The new title would be Little House in the Woods. This three book deal was the kind of offer writers dream about, especially in the depths of the Depression. But as I point out in Laura Ingalls Wilder, A Writer's Life, Wilder was in for a rough ride. Publishing then and now is usually precarious. This is just a little note to tell you that Mr. Knopf has decided to give up the children's department the first of the year. So I shall not be there after that time. They are cutting down expenses. Marion Fury had been laid off. The children's department at Knopf would close, and Wilder's book, if she signed that three book deal, would be orphaned. There would be no one at Knopf to champion Little House in the Woods, our work with Wilder to develop the next two. For once in her relationship as advisor to her mother, Lane was stunned and unsure of herself. She wrote back to Fury, my mother does not know what to do and I dare not advise her because I know nothing whatever of the juvenile field. Now, of course, the story ends well for Wilder. But I want to make a couple of quick points about this. What's extraordinary here is even though Marion Fury was about to be laid off, even though Wilder was a first-time author, even though Lane herself didn't much believe in the value of the manuscript, she wrote Fury, for example, that there's not enough money in it to make it worth my agent's while. Fury herself took up the cause to get Little House in the Woods published. She advised Wilder not to sign the three-book deal with Knopf and telephoned Virginia Kirkus, head of the children's book department at Harper and Brothers, about the manuscript. Kirkus wasn't impressed. An elderly lady was writing a true story in fictional form about her pioneer childhood. Well, I had heard that tale before. Fury persisted, met Kirkus for tea in New York, and gave her a copy of Wilder's accomplished manuscript. On December 8, 1931, Kirkus wrote Wilder, we are accepting your manuscript, Little House in the Woods. Not surprisingly, Kirkus asked for more editorial changes, as editors always do, and ultimately proposed a new title for the book, Little House in the Big Woods. It was published on April 6, 1932, with illustrations by Helen Sewell. Virginia Kirkus at Harper and Brothers later said that it was the book no depression could stop. And yet, Wilder was never offered a multiple book deal again. For all she knew, when The Little House in the Big Woods was published in 1932, she might not sell another manuscript again. <laughs>